Well, good afternoon. Today is week four, right, of the chronological. Uh, we're moving along, and we have blown right on through the book of Genesis. And so we've covered a vast territory. And then we come today, this, this week and next week, we're going to be dealing with and talking about the book of Job. Now, Job, sometimes it's, the question is in, in a chronological or even in a, in a one-year Bible, they almost don't know what to do with Job, where to put it. And so a lot of times they'll put it kind of like the end of the Old Testament just to kind of stick it somewhere and then they move on. And so, but the thing is, is the reason why in most chronologicals these days it comes around sometime around Genesis is most of the time it's looked at as that Job and Job's life is in a period of time that seems like it's close in time with the life of Abraham maybe even Isaac and Jacob. So it's, it's a possibility, a real possibility, he was a contemporary of Abraham's, and it, which could have also meant it overlaps into Isaac and Jacob's time period. Um, so that's why in a chronological study it's here. And in this case, it's kind of like, okay, we finished the book of Genesis, now let's just hit the whole book of Job at one time, instead of kind of putting it back in the, the middle of Genesis when we were talking about Abraham. So I think it works out okay. The, the interesting part about the book of Job is, one, we have no idea who wrote it. No idea. We don't even know exactly when it was written. Okay. But the book of Job, I think, is one of the most interesting of all books because it's not just a story. It's a story about a man, an actual man who lived. Okay, And we get something very unique. The way the story lays out, we also get to see and hear what God says, not only about Job. We get to see and hear a conversation between God and Satan. And then we get to see it play out on earth, and then we get to see the conversations between Job and the friends. We'll use the term friends loosely as we go through this uh, with those guys. And then we get to see, it's really more of a one-sided conversation when God actually shows up and it's a conversation with God and Job. It's more of Job going, you know what, I'll just sit here and be quiet. Okay, And so it's a unique book. Uh, We get to learn... Uh, several things, several areas that come into play out of the book of Job. And so a few of them are, we get a little bit of knowledge about this man named Job. We just don't know much about him. We also get some insight into the mind of God. That's kind of unusual in the dealing specifically with a purpose and a period of time with a person. So we get to know a little bit about the inside of the mind of God. We also get to see Satan and his really his limited abilities, okay? We get to see the wisdom and the false philosophies of man, okay? That comes into play with this. We also get to see um, how not to comfort somebody that's hurting and having problems, okay? We get to see what happens when God actually does show up. To me, this next week, to me, is the best part of the book when God shows up. Okay, And then we also get to learn what Job never gets to learn. And that was why. Job never figures out. God God comes and talks to him, but Job never finds out about why. We get to know why. Okay, So... First thing I want to do is we look in Job chapter 1, and we're just going to kind of work through uh, some of these chapters here and kind of pull out some of these things as we go. The first thing we see in Job chapter 1 is we get to see information about Job himself, and it's what God's telling us about Job. In Job chapter 1 verse 1, there was a man in the country of Uz named Job, He was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. That's a pretty good statement for God to make. Now, how do we know God made it? This is His book. 
But he's also here, just in a minute, going to say the exact same things to Satan. Okay? So we know from the beginning that he is a man of integrity. He's an upright guy. He is a righteous man. I mean, what? He's, he's walking with the Lord. He's following the Lord. He's keeping short accounts. Any sin, he's what? He's dealing with it immediately. We'll see that in just a second, too. Okay? He's extremely wealthy. Okay, he is extremely wealthy. He's got seven sons and three daughters. Okay, ten kids. His estate, and it tells us how big his estate is. It's huge. Okay, and then verse four. His sons used to take turns having banquets in their houses. They would send an invitation to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. And this was his what? His regular practice. Okay, This is a man who walked with God daily. Okay, Really and truly walked with God. Okay, Now, that's the picture of Job the man. Okay. Then the next scene comes in is where God and Satan come into the picture of this story. Okay, And basically, verse 6 says, One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. These are more than likely angels that came before the Lord at a certain time coming to present themselves. And Satan also came with them. Now that's kind of telling. Does that mean he's got access to God? Sure he does. Because even the Bible tells us he's what the accuser of the brethren, right? Well, it's hard to be the accuser of if you ain't ever in front of God. Okay? So he comes in before God. And God asks him a question. Have you come, where have you come from? Now, does God not know? No. Anytime you answer questions, you're what? You're starting dialogue. So he's asking a question. Where have you come from? Here's what Satan says. From roaming through the earth. Satan answered him walking around and walking around on it. What does that mean? Well, y'all remember, he tried to take over God's spot. What happened? He got his butt kicked out. Where did he land? Chapter 3 of Genesis, right in the garden. Okay, He's doing what? He's telling him, well, I've been roaming around the earth. Well, if that also goes into play, what does the Bible tell us that Satan's like a what? A roaring lion? Waiting on who he can what? Devour? Okay. So what's he doing? I'm roaming around on the earth. That don't mean he's just hanging out trying to figure out, eh, it's a nice sunset tonight, let me sit down here by the fire. No, he's roaming around doing Satan's things. Okay. Now, <clears throat> verse 8, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Satan comes in, presents himself for the Lord. I've been on the earth roaming around. Have you considered my servant Job? And what does he say? Here's you need to pay real close attention when what God says about it. No one else on earth is like him. A man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. That's God verifying to who? Satan and to us that Job is what? He's a man of integrity. He's a righteous man. Okay? Now notice what next happens. Satan answers the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't go, um, God, um, who are we talking about? What's his last name? Uh, which, where does he live? I mean, well, I don't know. Is there 25, 30 million people on the planet at this point? Uh, could you identify him? No, he immediately what? Knows who Job is. Okay, look. Satan's not like God. He can't be everywhere at one time. He's just like us. He's in a location at a certain point in time. Okay, But he knows what? He knows who Job is. And he says, Haven't you placed a hedge around him and his household and everything he owns? Job, yeah, yeah we know who Job is. He's what? He's the one that you've put a hedge around we can't touch. Okay? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Yeah, we know him. We can't touch him. What's that tell us? That gives us a little insight about Satan, doesn't it? 
Satan, look, he in Genesis chapter 3, he took the authority keys that God had given Adam. But even though he has some authority on the earth, guess who rules and overrules? God does. So even though he has ability to do a lot of damage, God still is the one that says yes and no and how far you can go. And in this case, up to this point, God has left what? Job completely hedged in and said, y'all can't mess with him. Okay, so what's Satan going to do? Well, his answer is going to be like most people's would be. Yeah, but you know what? Take away all that. Take that protection away. He's going to do what? He would curse you. He only follows you because well, you're, you're making him wealthy and you're giving him all these stuff and he's got great protection because of you. He's not having to deal with stuff like everybody else. That's the only reason. So God says, okay. You can have all that. Take it all away. Don't touch him. So what happens first round of this goes in within just moments of time. All ten of his kids killed. All of his possessions, stolen or killed. All of his servants, killed or taken. Okay? Houses, gone. Everything, gone. And just as one person escapes to come tell him, as he hears that, can you put yourself in, your, in his position for a minute? When one hits, and you hadn't even been able to grab and wrap your mind around that, the next one hits. And the next one hits. And one of those of those that come is what? The big one that says, oh, by the way, you're, all your kids are dead. And so by Satan's thought process was, well, if you take all that away, he's going to do what? He's going to curse you. But what does he do? Look at verse 20, chapter 1, verse 20. Then Job stood up, tore his robes, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. Now, that don't mean he was sitting over there singing the Hallelujah Chorus. Okay. But he's falling down. He's act, it's an act of worship. And he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not cursed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay. After all of that. Look, that's a man that's been walking with the Lord a while. That's a man that's got faith. That's a man who's able to handle stuff because it wasn't just a little fleeting. He had a little, he had a little God here or there. This is a guy who's been walking with the Lord. Okay. And thus he can have those type things. Then what's going to happen? Chapter two. Well, uh, round two, Satan comes back and presents himself to the Lord again. Verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. <clears throat> the Lord God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Look, God's doing what? He, throughout this whole thing, He's setting up a test, right? Setting up a test. No one else on earth is like Him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. He still re, uh, retains his integrity, even though you incite me against him to destroy him for no good reason. What's God just say? That whole first test, he didn't just wobble. He didn't fail. He what? He passed it. Okay? He's still a man that's got his integrity. He's still righteous before the Lord. Even after all that. Now, what's going to take place? Satan's going to know the next thing. And the next thing is, oh, well, skin for skin. And here's the thing. Satan has he's been watching people for a long time. And so the thought process is, okay, well, that didn't work. But you know what? If you touch his body, if you touch his health, pain and anguish will make him curse you. Make him walk away from you. And honestly, it's a, probably a pretty good gamble because a lot of people do. Okay? A lot of people do. So God's like, okay, have at it. You just can't kill him. And so he ends up with bowls on him to where he is in such pain, the little tip top hairs on his head, all the way to the bottom of his feet, hurt. Not a little. A lot. 
the pain of, look, you've already lost everything. It's just you and your wife. And now you are sitting here, what? In pain from your head to your toes. Extreme pain. Okay. Which a lot of times would cause people to go, you know what? My God ain't working. Let me go try something else. But what does he do? He stays faithful. But verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. I mean, let's be honest. You've lost everything. Your kids are gone. The anguish, the mental and the physical pain has got to be totally unbearable. I mean, really and truly, the only way you're probably going to get any real physical and mental rest would be, in thought process anyway, would be what? Die. And look, if you'll just, whatever has caused this, if you'll just curse God, you can go ahead and die, and this can be over with. Okay? But what does he tell her? You speak as a foolish woman. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. He kept his integrity. <clears throat> he, kept his, he kept with the Lord. He didn't change anything. Now, the rest of this chapter are, starts where these friends are going to show up. Again, let's use friends only because that's what the Bible calls them as friends. But honestly, uh, if any of us have friends like them, we need new friends. Okay. The best thing they did was the chapter 2, verse 13, the last verse. Wisest thing they did. They sat on the ground with him seven days and nights, but no one spoke a word to him because they saw his suffering was very intense. Sometimes the best thing to do is just shut up. Just shut up. Don't talk. But I, but we, we all know, I mean, we've been there, right? Somebody's suffering, they're hurting, and we have a tendency to think we need some kind of wise words to make them feel better, right? But have y'all ever come up with the exact perfect words? No. But sometimes, not saying a word, but just having somebody around you is the best comfort. Wisest thing they did until they opened their mouth was just to sit here and be there with him. Now, chapter 3, Job's going to start the conversation. He's going to start this dialogue. Okay, And I'm thinking by the time he gets through a couple of rounds of this, he probably wishes he would have just been quiet. Okay, But when Job's in chapter 3, when he starts talking, remember, this is a guy who is, I mean, physical pain off the chart, mental anguish off the chart. Your kids are gone. I mean, look, that one alone ought to be 10 kids dead. I mean, that'd be hard pill to swallow. Okay. And so when you read chapter three, you need to realize this is coming out of somebody who's in great pain mentally and physically when he speaks. All right. Now, chapter three, verse into verse 13, rolling into 14. He says, then I would be at rest. What's he talking about? If I, had, if I hadn't even been born, okay? Or if I would have died at birth. I would have been at rest with the kings and counselors of the earth who re rebuilt ruined cities for themselves or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden like a miscarried child, like infants who never see daylight? What's he saying? It would, look, this is George Bailey at his best. Okay, it, what was his famous thing that got him going? Remember, he said it'd been better if I'd have what never been born. Now, you can kind of understand. Look, we've all been through stuff, right? We've all been through pain. We've all been through anguish. I would lay a charge that ain't none of us been through what Job's been through. And look, we play our own movie. We're the star of our own movie. Everything, everybody else is what a supporting actor in our own movies, right? And we all think that we've had the worst that it's been. But look, have any of y'all had all your worldly possessions, 10 kids killed, and everything taken from you in one moment in time? Okay. Oh, and then when you think that's bad enough, a few days later, uh, now you're, you're physically in pain that you can't move. Okay. He's ha I can't think of anything worse than what? Just death at this point. And that's what he's thinking. 
Hey, it'd have been better for me. So you kind of got to give him some understanding here. He's in pain. And then verse 26 says, I cannot relax or be calm. I have no rest for turmoil has come. Now, chapter 4 starts the first of the friends. Okay? Eliphaz, look at verse 6. Isn't your pity, uh, isn't your piety, I'm sorry, isn't your piety your confidence and the integrity of your life your hope? Consider who has perished when he was innocent. Where have the honest been destroyed? In my experience, those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. They perish at a single blast from God and come to an end by the breath of His nostrils. Now, it's going to get worse what these guys say. But what's his argument? His argument is what? You're putting your confidence in what you call in your integrity. What you're calling your righteous. Okay, But he's now turned around and he's saying some incorrect statements right off the start. Consider who has perished when he was innocent. What you got to remember, remember this is, if he's contemporary with Abraham, y'all remember when we were talking about Abraham? Y'all remember all them wars and all the battles and all that? It's not like the earth was under, under peace. It was in turmoil. There are wars. Look, does that would there have been innocent people that get caught up into trouble? Are there innocent people now that get caught up into stuff? What he's saying here is innocent people don't ever get caught up into anything, and that's a lie. That's a lie. Even for that day. That's a lie. Okay? And have the honest ever been destroyed? Well, you know what? I, you can think back into recent history. A big one was uh, World War II. A lot of innocent people got what? Destroyed. Okay? So, again, not true. In my experience, all right, look, humanistic wisdom, humans' wisdom and philosophy can get you in trouble more than anything else. And when you ever work off of your experience, the problem is your experience could cause you to what? Not be in line with what the truth of God's Word is. Okay? In my experience, those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. In my experience. Well, that's not exactly true either. There's lots of times that people... A lot of injustice goes for a long time before anything happens to them. Okay? And they perish at a single blast from God. Look, people, only people who get what's happening to you are people that are what? Guilty. Guilty of great sin. Okay? So this is, this is Eliphaz. This starts it. Chapter 6 and 7 is where Job comes in and now wants to rebuttal the argument. Chapter 7, verse 19. Will you ever look away from me or leave me alone long enough to swallow? If I have sinned, what have I done to you, watcher of humanity? Why have you made me your target so that I have become a burden to you? Why not forgive my sin and pardon my iniquity? What's going on? In his argument he's making here, his argument is, I've not done anything to cause this. I don't know why all this has happened to me, but I know it's not because I've sinned. And that's going to be the friend's argument all along, and his argument is all along going to be, I've not done anything. This is not due to sin. Okay? And so he is saying here in this case, if I've sinned, okay, and which means, remember, he Bible said he had done what he was very careful. His regular practice was what? Sacrifice and to make sure that he had clear accounts with the Lord. That was regular practice. So those are things that you know about, but you can sin sometimes and things that you don't know about, right? So he's looking at this going, if if there's something that I don't even know about, then can, won't you give me the opportunity to repent? 
Okay? From this. So he's making his first argument to say, I'm what? I'm innocent because you are pointing at me and saying, this is happening because you're guilty. Okay? Now, y'all remember, well, as, I, as we walk through these, a couple of things to always remember. These guys, these friends, they make a lot of bad statements about God and about Job. Okay? They make a lot of false statements. And so Job, on the other hand, he's not making false statements about God per se, but what he is going to start to do is he's going to start defending himself and he's going to say, I'm innocent, and if anybody's guilty, it's God. Okay? Now, I want to go ahead and show you the end of the story so that we can, it helps as you visualize the rest of this this week and next week. I'm not just saying what I just said, just going, okay, I'm pulling this out, and here it is. The friends, well, they, they said bad things about God, and they said untruths. Okay, look, let's go ahead and hit this one. Blasphemy, or a form of blasphemy, is anything that you or I can say about God that's not true. It's not just a cuss word. Anything we say about God that is not true is a form of blasphemy. Okay? Anything. All right. In their case, what they're going to do is they're going to use humanistic philosophy mindset, in my experience, and they're going to project those things onto God. They're also making statements about Job's guilt, but God has already, that we know, has said what? He's not guilty. So they're making false statements throughout this, and it's going to get worse as they go. Job, on the other hand, is going to constantly go back and he's going to debate and argue the fact, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty. If anybody's guilty, it's God. Okay? Now, how? so am I just pulling that out? No. Look at Job chapter... 40, Job chapter 40, God has already showed up on the scene. But I'm going to show you where this is. Job 40, verse 6, the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. I love this. Get ready to answer me like a man. Pull up your pants, big boy. Stand up. I got some questions for you. When I question you, you will inform me. Would you really challenge my justice. Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Again, what's Joe's whole plan through this? He keeps arguing, I'm innocent, and if God, and he'll even make the statement, if God were here, I'd make him tell you I'm innocent. And God just verifies this. Now the other side, how about, the, how about them three friends? Okay? The three friends who've been making all these statements about God. Chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me. And my servant Job has. Remember, Job wasn't making false statements. He was just accusing God of being the one that's caused this. Okay? But the friends have been what? Throughout all these things, as you keep... So why do I want you to see this now? Because as you go through all this stuff, I want you to be able to look at it and say, these guys are making some false statements. And some of them sound good from human wisdom. But they're making statements about God or about Job that are not true. Because we can go back and look. What did Job chapter 1 say? Job was what? A righteous man. What did God say? He's a righteous man. What are they saying? You're not a righteous man, and God's telling us you're not a righteous man. Okay, So they're guilty of it. So Job's making this. Now, chapter 8, go back to chapter 8. 
Bildad, the next so-called friend, jumps into the into the debate. <clears throat> Verse 2. How long will you go on saying these things? Your words are a blast of wind. Now remember, they're talking, he's talking to a guy that just lost his 10 kids and everything he owns and sitting there in pain. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Look, this one's the one. Uh, this is crazy. Since your children sinned against him, he gave them over to their rebellion. Your kids are all dead. You're sitting here in pain. All this is going, and what did this say? Your kids, because of what because of the rebellion in their hearts, your kids, your ten kids are dead because of that. Is that comfort? Again, I, would, I wouldn't want to call these friends. Okay. So we learn in partially here what? What not to say to somebody. Okay. Verse 5, But if you earnestly seek God and ask the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, then He will move even now on your behalf and restore the homes where, you're, and where your righteousness dwells. Your kids, they're dead because of they were rebellious to God. And if you get your act together and get yourself right, God will give it all back to you. He's going to restore you. Why? Because the only reason you've had all this is because you were good, but you're now, there are apparently some big sin in your life. And God's wiped it all out and putting you through to this. Okay? Now, <clears throat> chapter, uh, same chapter, chapter 8. Verse 20, look, God does not reject a person of integrity. Again, this is a lie. Now, he's not, I'm not talking about rejecting them from, long, from a, a salvation standpoint, but, as, but on the earth, in their living life, he's, he's telling them God does not reject a person of integrity and he will not, and he will not support evildoers. In life going on out there, people of integrity still what? Face trials and troubles. Okay. It rains on the what? The huh? Yeah. It it rains on the just and the unjust. Okay? Not just on the unjust, but they're trying to say what? Nothing comes to a righteous man. It only comes to somebody that's unrighteous and well Job, <laughs> you're the picture of it. Now, chapter 9, Job's reply. Look, there's a reason why the Bible tells us you remember in Proverbs it talks about Arguing with a fool? There's a reason why it tells us not to argue with the fool. Because what happens? You start, an, They start talking and you start talking back and forth. Eventually, out of emotion, what will take place? Nobody wants to give up the argument. Everybody wants to prove themselves right. Okay? And so what do you have? You've got these friends. They're now making arguments on why you're guilty. And Job starts to get more and more, as we look into these, they're going to get more heated and more hardcore. And he's going to be arguing more and more. And, and Job, Job's going to let... You ever let your mouth get you in trouble? In an argument? <laughs> you what? You keep going, right? Job's going to do that. That's why God at the end is going to come back and go, okay, big boy, pull up your pants and answer some questions. Because his mouth's been going. So as he keeps going, he's going to start arguing harder and harder because he don't want to give up the fact that I'm innocent. And they're going to argue harder and harder because they don't want to give up the fact that you're guilty. Okay? Job, in chapter 9, verse 14, How then can I answer him? or choose my arguments against him. Even if I were in the right, I could not answer. I could only beg my judge for mercy. Even if I'm right before God, there's nothing that I can really do about it. Okay. If I summoned him and he answered me, I do not believe he would pay attention to what I said. He's talking about what? If I could get God to answer it, if I could get him to listen to my argument, okay? What? He's, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Okay? Look at verse 32. For he is not like a man like me that I can answer him, that we can take each other to court. He's wanting to what? Prove. 
If he, if he had the opportunity, he'd take God to court and he'd go and what? Try to prove in the court of law that I'm righteous and I'm innocent. That I haven't done these things that you, the friends, keep saying God's judging me for. Okay? There is no mediator between us to lay his hands on both of us. <laughs> Look, I go, if we were to go in the courtroom, it's God and there's nothing in between. It's me and him. <clears throat> Chapter 10. Verse 2, he says, I will say to God, (laughs) do not declare me guilty. Skip down to verse 6, that you look for my iniquity and search for my sin, even though you know that I am not wicked. He's what? He's arguing with these guys, but he's talking about God and he's saying, hey, what? He's even, I mean, he's, we're in a court of law thought process here. Okay? Even though you know I'm not God, if I could get God in there, you, you know I'm not guilty of this. Okay? And he's trying to what? Convince these friends. Okay? Your hands shape me, you form me. Will you now d- turn and destroy me? Again, what's Job doing? He's trying to make the case. Look, and does he even have to make the case? No. Granted, he doesn't know the backstory. He doesn't know that God's already said he's a righteous man. He doesn't know that God and Satan have already been having this discussion. He doesn't know all these things. Okay? But he knows that he hasn't done anything to deserve this. But instead of just, he's doing what? He starts talking and defending himself. Chapter 11, here's Zophar. Again, these are friends that are there to comfort you. Look at chapter 11, verse 2. Should this abundance of words go unanswered? And such a talker be acquitted? Should your babbling put others to silence so that you can keep on ridiculing with no one to humiliate you? Again, that's comfort? What was the best part of their comfort? The end of chapter 2 when they sat there for seven days with their mouth shut. Okay. And then look over at verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11. Surely he knows which people are worthless. If he sees iniquity, will he not take note of it? But a stupid person will gain understanding as soon as a wild donkey is born to a human. As for you, Job, if you direct your heart and spread out your hands to him in prayer, and if there is iniquity in your hand, remove it, and don't allow injustice to dwell in your tents, then you will hold your head high, free from fault. You will be firmly established and be unafraid. For you will forget your sufferings, recalling it only as water that has flowed. What's he saying here? You know what, Job? You're guilty. There's iniquity in your household. If you would just agree with us and just put that away, God will what? God will take all this, his hand off of you. He will restore you. Again, what are they telling him? Job, all this is because you're what? You're guilty, and we're, we're, we're your friends. And I, I, this is kind of like when somebody says, with all due respect, and what they mean is, I'm gonna, I say that so that I can disrespect you. I, I, I hate this next one where they go, well, I'm just being honest. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, Everyone in here is guilty of it, and you've all been, you've all been victims of it, right? Somebody, when they're trying to comfort you, and what do they do? They, they, they hit you real, real hard when you're down, right? And then they, they preference it or after the, either before or after they come back and go, but I'm just trying to be honest with you. Okay? Is that, does that ever comfort anybody? No. All right? Not at all. Some of y'all look guilty already just talking about it. All right? Now... But that's, that's where they're at. Okay. Now, Job again is going to reply. Look at chapter 13 real quick. 
Verse 3, yet I prefer to speak to the Almighty. Here's where he's... St- he's get- Look, his emotions and his mouth are getting him even deeper here. I prefer to speak to the Almighty and argue my case before God. You use lies like plaster. You are all worthless healers. Now that is true. They are kind of worthless from the comforting healing prospect here. Okay, They're pathetic at it. If only you would shut up and let that be your wisdom. There's truth too. The wisest they were was the seven days with no talking. Okay. Hear now my argument and listen to my offense. Here he is again, though Job's still going, what? i got to defend myself. i got to defend myself. It seemed like there's somewhere in the Bible, doesn't it say just be quiet and let God deal with that? Okay. And then verse 15, even if he kills me though, I will hope in him. I will still defend my ways before him. Yes, this will result in my deliverance. For no godless person can appear before the Lord. And that's true. Okay. You're going for God, you got to be what? You got to be clean. Okay. But here he's saying what? His hope, even if even through all this, if if he dies, his hope's still in the Lord. But he does still plan to what? Defend himself. Okay. Now, you get over chapter 15, you get Eliphaz. Uh, he comes into play. Same thing. He's got to throw in stuff again. Chapter 16, verse 2. I have heard many things like these. And then here's, here's the thing. You are all miserable comforters. Okay. Let's learn a few things from these guys. Chapter 18, Bildad again. Verse 2, how long until you stop talking, Job? Show some sense that we can talk. These guys are, man. Y'all want some friends like them? Verse 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 2, how long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Look, words have power. They do. And as we take this and what do we... We'll look more in depth about God's side of this next week when He shows up. But again, what am I trying to point out through all this? We can learn from Job. Look, you ain't got to argue every point. You ain't got to prove you're right on everything. Okay? Well, they're looking at each other across the room. Okay? But you can also learn from the friends. Look, Especially in what we do here. These are broken folks. When y'all came in, were y'all were y'all well? You're broken folks. Okay? And we can learn from what? These so-called friends, what doesn't work. <laughs> Let me be honest with you. Sometimes just a, there's a time for being honest. Okay? And we've had those moments of this is just a listening session, right? But those are usually the last resorts. They don't. They shouldn't be where we start. Okay. Now, chapter nineteen, verse two. How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Okay. And then, verse uh, chapter twenty. Zophar back into it. Verse two. This is why my unsettling thoughts compel me to answer because I'm upset. You're supposed to be a comforter, and you're there, and now because of somebody talking, the one that's hurting, and you're saying what? I'm upset. That's the reason. I'm angry. I have heard a rebuke that insults me. You're there to be a comfort, and what happened? You got mad and got all, you got all twisted up in the argument. Okay? Now... Wrapping this little section up here, chapter 20, verse 4. Don't you know that ever since antiquity... (laughs) Now, they aren't that far from the flood, okay? So antiquity to them ain't that lot of years, okay? But don't you know that ever since antiquity, from the time a human was placed on earth, 
The joy of the wicked has been brief, and the happiness of the godless has lasted only a moment. Pure lie. Okay? And Job, I made a mark in here right across the page, and Job answers this correctly. Look over chapter 22, verse 7. He says, Why do the wicked continue to live, growing old and becoming powerful? Is that true now? Yes. Is that true all the time? Yes. Wicked people live long lives. Wicked people do things, okay? Their children are established while they are still alive and their descendants before their eyes. Do wicked people on the earth have kids and families and grow and do all these things? Sure they do. Their homes are secure and they're free of fear. No rod of God strikes them. Their bulls breed without fail. Their cows calve and do not miscarry. They let their little ones run around like lambs and their children skipping about. What's he doing? He's, they had just said, guilty people, wicked people don't, don't live productive, long, happy lives. And Job's going, uh, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Okay. Can y'all think of some people in the world today that live happy lives that are not saved? That's one of the problems with America. Ain't much adversity. You know, why do I need to be saved from someone? I got a pretty good life. Okay. And then he goes on to say, singing to the tambourine and the lyre, rejoicing at the sounds of the flute. They spend their days in prosperity and they go down to Sheol in peace. There's lots of wicked people that go on and die and go on and, and what? They died in peace and prosperity. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We don't want to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him, that we will, be, uh, that we will gain by pleading with Him? Job's pointing out what? They're making false claims about who? God. God's not... Every time somebody sins... Look, if God, if God wiped everybody out the moment you sinned, would there be anybody on the planet? No. Hey, so what do we, can we take and look from all of this and realize? One, again, I want to make sure we understand. These guys, as you read these, they're making lots of false claims about God. And they're doing it, and some of them sound nice and wise and, and a worldly wisdom, but that's humanistic thinking. And they're doing it out of their thought processes and their experiences. And remember, you get to the end, God's already said, y'all didn't tell truths about me. Okay? So be real careful. Some of y'all probably heard me say this before. Be real, real careful when you start to ever say something about the, about God, no matter what it is, okay? Be real, real careful. Because these guys, they thought they were being honest. To, oh, there it is. We're being honest with you. They thought they were being honest, and what were they doing? They were really making false statements about God. And God, I mean, He makes Job, He makes them bring an offering, and Job has to pray and do a sacrifice so God will forgive them for what they did. Okay? So, we have to be real careful. Look, I got a friend of mine that I was discipling him one time. And y'all probably had people, y'all have heard say this. Hope none of you said it, but maybe. Okay. But he was telling me, he goes, Yeah, I've got this guy. And he goes, I've been taking what and trying to disciple him because I had been discipling him for a long time. And he said, You know, this guy got caught up in some pornography. And so he was telling him about it. And he said, You know, he said, I told him, I said, You know, God knows that we're men. God knows that we're like that. And I think God's going to overlook some of those type things. And I went, ooh, hold up. That may, that may make the person over there hearing it feel good, and it may make you a little more comfortable to say it that way, but you just told a complete lie on God. That would be called blasphemy. And that was an ex, kind of an extreme example but anytime you look into something and you go up to somebody and you've given them something, you know, here's what God says or here's what I think God will. Okay. Anytime you start out by, well, I think my God, I think, be real careful and analyze it before you finish saying it because God said we're going to give an account for 
everything we say. Okay? And blasphemy doesn't just mean we're using God's name as a cuss word. Okay? So realize that as you look through this, that piece of it. Realize and look at it as what? As Job getting in the, caught up in the emotions of it, and Job's what? Arguing everything. Look, do we need to argue every single thing? No. Even if we feel like we're right, sometimes the best thing to do is just be quiet. Okay? And with what we do here, when we are ministering to these folks that are coming in, and they are broken, and they're hurt, don't be like these three friends. Because our words can what? Can damage them. Especially when we're just telling you the truth. Okay? There's a time for that. But look and learn from this. Okay, This is a pretty extreme example to kind of get a picture from. I mean, he just lost his kids. He's lost everything. And now what? He's got three friends that are over there going, let's just tell you the truth. Your kids have died because they were sinning, and you're undergoing all this because, well, you're evil. It's not going to win it. They didn't win it for Job. It sure won't win it for them. Okay? So those are the type of things to look at as we go through this. And then look as we get on, and you get into next week, start to look at when God shows up. Because, see, Job's going to run his big mouth. And if God were here, <laughs> and I love it when God shows up. I think it's one of the best pictures in the Bible when God shows up and tells him what? My paraphrase version. Stand up, big boy. Pull up your pants. i got some questions for you, and you're going to answer me. Okay? All right.